that's what Joseph would have had. Because Joseph is basically, uh, unless you really pay attention to him, he was a nobody concerning the Christmas story. But I want to bring out some information. And what I want to talk to you about mostly this morning, and I know that it's going to be very impacting for us in our lives, is what do you do? What do you do when your world begins to crumble? Anybody been there? What do you do when all of your expectations that you have great expectations of, thinking that everything was going to go just the way you had figured it out, when everything begins to fall? What do you do at that moment? Well, I want you to please understand, I, here's my analogy. My analogy is, life is like a roller coaster. Anybody love the roller coasters? Go to, no, you don't love the roller coasters. You go to the amusement park, and no matter whether you love them or not, it is the biggest attraction nowadays at any kind of amusement park. Because the, roller, the, the Ferris wheel is kind of a, you know, old, old nature thing. But now the roller coaster, everybody wants to see just how much can they endure. At first when you go and you watch it, you're watching other people, you're hearing them scream, you're seeing them, you're seeing them ready to, to vomit, you're, you're seeing them getting scared to death because that's what the roller coaster is all about, right? And you say, I'm not going to get on that. But then you find yourself sitting in the car ready to go because you can't hold yourself back. I don't care who you are. Now a roller coaster nowadays, I've, I've, I looked this up, the highest roller coaster we have around here is at Cedar Point, 456 feet. That's pretty high. So if you are afraid of height, you're doing yourself a real justice if you want to be afraid. So you find yourself getting in the car, they take you and they slowly take you out from under the port, and the first thing you see that you're going to go up and ascend on a hill. And that ascension is ever so slow because they want to work on your mind. And you're sitting there and you have white knuckle fear because you're looking down and you're starting to see people are starting to look about this small, especially when you get to the very height, the top of the height of the, of the hill. And it's still going slow. And as it's going ever so slow, it just goes around the bend a little bit and then the next thing you know, it drops off as if it's going down like a plane on fire. Well, I want you to know that all of a sudden you start to jolt and jilt and you're starting to go through the loop-de-loops and you are losing your mind and somebody's screaming and somebody's deafening your ear and then you come to realize it's you because you can't hold back because you're scared to death. And so the whole ride has that kind of determination. Well, that's what life is all about. Life has a lot of ebbs and flows. We love it when we are on the upswing. We love it when we are on the ascension because that means then, you know, when, when, we, when you get married, when you have children, when you buy a car, when you buy a house, when, you, uh, when, when life is beautiful, when you're going on vacation, we love those moments where you are going in a promotional state where everything is wonderful. And if you are a Christian, those are the times where you can raise your hands and you can say, praise God, praise God, because life is beautiful. I sense the peace of God in my life. I sense the peace of God in my, in, in my household. Amen? Amen. But then don't be, don't be tricked. Because you know as, I, as well as I do that life doesn't always end up where we live on top of a mountain. <coughs> we are going to have times of struggle. You are going to go on the downhill spin and you are going to fall as fast as you could ever imagine. Jesus Christ himself tells us that we will go through trials and tribulations of many kinds. And when we are going down, and when all hell breaks loose against us, that's when you will find people start to say, Oh my God, where's God in all this? And they start to fret, they start to panic, they go, <coughs> go into a frenzy, and they say, Where is the peace of God? You ever been there? Well, I want you to know something. The peace of God, the peace of God, you have to hit that lower button for me. <coughs> You have to hit the lower button so that I can have control. Show her trace real quick. They did. They did. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is, no. your, is your clicker on? Yeah, it's on. <laughs> I'm going to wait because I want you to see. Okay, the peace of God 
is not the absence of problems. I'm going to say it again. The peace of God is not the absence of problems. The peace of God is the presence of Christ. In the midst of your worst scenario, your peace comes because Christ is there with you. Amen? Amen. And so I don't care what you're going through, if you have the peace of God with you, you are going to come out victorious. Amen. And Jesus Christ is our peace. Matter of fact, you come and find, it says in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, Jesus himself said, And lo, I am with you always unto the ends of the earth. He's promising us, I will never leave you nor forsake you. As a matter of fact, as we are about to read the Christmas story, you are going to find that it says that his name is Emmanuel, which means God with us. So again, I tell you, if God be for you, what can be against you to destroy you? It doesn't matter if you're going on the uphill swing. It doesn't matter if you're taking a nosedive right now because that's the way your life is going. You can have peace on the up. You can have peace in the middle. You can have peace when all hell is broke loose because Christ is your peace. So again, I repeat, peace is not the absence of a problem. Peace is the presence of Christ in the midst of your problem. Amen? Amen. And I want to show you the story of Joseph's part in the Christmas story. In Matthew chapter 1, starting with verse 18, here's what it says. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was, after his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Now look at the word betrothed. And if you remember what I said last week, to be betrothed to one another is not the same as what we call engagement today. Because the betrothal, the betrothal that they had was a matter of monies was exchanged, there was commitments and vows made, and there was families that had made committed vows one to another, as well as the two individuals that were going to be joined together. So to be betrothed in that day it was the same as if they were married. The only thing that they could not do is they could not consummate the marriage. But otherwise, if they were as good as married. So we come to find that Mary and Joseph are betrothed at this point, And they did not come together, which means they did not consummate their marriage. But yet she was found with a child by the, of the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Everybody say dream. dream. I highlighted it, I underlined it, because that is a very important word that we're going to be looking at. And the, the angel said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son. And you shall call his name Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled. Which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying. Behold the virgin shall be with child and bear a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel. Which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took to him his wife, and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he called. Everybody say he. He. He called. Who is he that is being spoken of here? Joseph. Joseph called his name Jesus. Who was the first one to speak up his name? It was Joseph. Joseph did it. There is no other name that has been given unto men whereby men can be saved other than the name of Jesus. And you come to find, Philippians tells us, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So don't downplay, let's not downplay the role of Joseph. Joseph was the one, when Mary gave birth to Jesus, he took this baby, took him in his arms, 
wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and as he's about to hand him over to his wife, to the mother of Christ, he was going to say, and I shall call your name Jesus. And when that name was first announced, the gates of heaven opened, and the flood of grace and mercy and peace and love and compassion and healing and all the virtue of heaven came pouring down to humanity. Can you say amen? amen. All because Joseph uttered the name of Jesus. I want to show you the character of Joseph for a minute. Joseph, the Bible calls him a just man. He is a, he was a good man. He was a man of honor. <coughs> Joseph was a man's man. As a matter of fact, you will find that Joseph was a carpenter. And as a carpenter, he wasn't a wuss because they didn't have power tools in those days. He had to use the strength of his hand. He had to use power. He had to have enormous, enormous muscle to be able to do the things that he did because they didn't even have the wood cultured and cured like we have today. They would cut down a tree, they would hone the tree, give it over to a carpenter, and then they would have to put the holes in it. They didn't have drills, so what they had to use are these awls, and they had to actually push and force that hole in the wood. So you can see that this man, Joseph, being a carpenter, he was truly a man's man. He was also a man of integrity. He was a man that was well known that when he gave you his word, you didn't have to think, I, I wonder if he's going to lie, if he's going to hold back, if he's not going to give me his promise. Whenever he gave you his word, his word was as good as gold. Amen? He also was a man of commitment. He was committed to God. He kept, he kept the law, he, the laws of Moses. He kept, he kept the festivities, all the feasts of Israel. He continued to, uh, to go to the temple. He continued to do everything and anything within his power so as to be able to be a man of upstanding and righteousness before God. He also was a man committed to Mary. When he fought, saw Mary and he fell in love with Mary, he wanted so badly to have her as his wife. But I want you to understand the culture of that day. I gave a little bit of this last, last week to you. But the culture of that day would have been, Mary would have had nothing to do with it. Not a thing. Because it would have been her father who would have either agreed to accept him as the son-in-law or reject him. And so obviously, Joseph was accepted and received by Mary's father. So Joseph would have had to go and he would have had to pay what, was be, what would be called a betrothal fee. He would have had to pay maybe two chickens, two cows, three horses, four goats. We don't know what it was. But I want you to know that Joseph purchased Mary. And make no mistake about it, you and I have been purchased by Jesus Christ. He has, he has come and He has redeemed us out of the hands of the enemy who had stolen mankind in the garden. Satan came and stole man, man's heart, man's mind, man's word and authority. Jesus came so as to purchase us back. We have been bought, we have been paid in full. That's why the Word of God says that we are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Amen? Amen? And so with all said, you come to find that Joseph now is, uh, is to a place where he is betrothed to Mary. And Mary turns around. They're not yet married. Mary turns around and says, I have something to say to you. He said, what? She says, I'm pregnant. And he had no thought. To whom? Because he knew I didn't do anything. She said, I'm pregnant because of God. God has come and told me that I am highly favored, blessed amongst women. That I am pregnant with the Son of God. Joseph had to think, now you have to understand, we're talking about Joseph, we're talking about a man in the Bible, a man that we look and we look up to, but he was a man. All the people in the Bible, historically, were human beings just like you and I. So don't try to put them in a supernatural place of thinking, my goodness, I wish I was like them. You are like them. Amen? <laughs> Joseph turned around at this time and probably thought, yeah, right. Yeah, right. Who's the, who's the father of this child? And Joseph had to probably go on to God and says, is this how I get rewarded? God, I have been honorable to you. I have been faithful to you. I have done wonderful things that you've asked me to do. I've volunteered myself. I've given to the treasury in the temple. And is this how I get paid back? That now my name is ruined, my family is ruined, everything about my, my character is going to be ruined? 
and he turns around, and now he's arguing with God. The same is with you and I. We get to that place. There are times where we argue with God. God, I did I not pay my tithe? Have I not been faithful with my tithe? And then here I am, I'm losing my job. My finances have gone down to where I'm about to bankrupt. Have I not volunteered myself in the house of God and my marriage is on the rocks? My children are out there and I can't seem to reel them back in. There are things that are breaking down all around me. And when that happens, your world gets shaken and you don't know what to do. Joseph is in a place where all of a sudden, when he comes to find my beloved, who I'm about to marry, tells me she's pregnant, and I'm not the father, and I know that I'm not the father. His world is shaken. And of course, he doesn't know how to respond to this. When your world gets shaken, any human being, there are only three ways that we generally respond. There would be only three ways that Joseph would have responded to the thing that had broken in his life, the thing that had caused him to be the most discouraged. The first thing would have been that Joseph might have said, the first response he might have said is, well, you know what? She tells me she's pregnant. She tells me that she's going to have a baby, and now she tells me that God is the Father, that God has supernaturally planted a seed inside of her. I don't buy it. I know that she's cheated on me. I know that she has had an affair. So what I'm going to do, Joseph could have said, I'm going to go to the elders of the city and I'm going to notify them of her ill behavior, of her, her immoral uh, Ill behavior, and they're going to use the law accordingly and they will take her outside the city gate and they will stone her to death. And that is called the feel-good response. In other words, you hurt me, I'm hurting you back. And that's the general response that we have. You hurt me, you, you punched me, I'm punching you back. You said something offensive against me and my family, I'm coming back at you. I got to deal with that all the time with my wife. She wants to go pe beat people up. She wants to go shoot people who hurt her children. You hurt me, I'm hurting you. Amen? Now that could have been one response that Joseph would have had. The second response that he could have possibly had was simply this. A response of saying, I love her too much. I don't want her to die, but at the same token, I don't want her. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to put her away under the canopy of darkness. I'm going to help her get out of town. I'm going to pack her up. I'm going to move her on. I want her to go as far away as she could possibly go because I don't even want to think about her after a while. I want her and me to no longer be two names drawn together. And when she goes, she's going to suffer the consequences of poverty, both she and her son. And that'll be on her, because nobody's going to want to be with her. But that's what I want to do. I just don't want to hurt her. That's called a painful response. In other words, I love her too much to hurt her, to have her killed, but at the same token, I need to get away from her. I need to have my heart healed. Or there could have been a third response. The third response would have been simply what's called the unthinkable response. The unthinkable response is simply that even though I know that she has hurt me, but an angel had told me that all this is so, so I'm going to believe what the angel has said, and I am now going to just take her as my wife, and I'm going to take this child, and I am going to raise this child as my own flesh and blood. I am going to take this child, and I am going to raise this child and adopt him as my own. That's the unthinkable. And let me tell you, back in that day, it was unheard of for any Jewish man to ever adopt another man's child. Even though everybody in society would have known that that was not Joseph's son, but yet he was going to do it anyhow. He was going to marry her. Mary was going to be his, his wife. And that child was going to be his adopted child. And the beauty behind this whole thought was that Joseph adopted Jesus. And 33 years later, Jesus would adopt every one of us. Amen? Amen? Think about that. So how do, you, how do you respond when your world falls apart? Well, you come to find that Timothy tells us in 2 Timothy <coughs> chapter 4, verse 5, it says, but you keep your head in all situations. 
You keep your mind about you. Why is he saying keep your head? Don't lose your temper. Because when we, when we fall apart, when our world is falling apart, when our world is shaking, we have a tendency, we have a tendency to make some bad decisions. Because we, fall, we make our decisions based on emotions and not on good reasoning. And before you know it, you make a trigger decision that actually is going to cost you to live with it, maybe for the rest of your life here on this earth. So you come to find that Timothy is telling us, keep your head about you. Keep your wits. Do not make quick decisions. Think it out. So how did Joseph deal with it? Matthew chapter 1 verse 19 said, Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was mind her, mindful to put her away. He was going to use the painful solution. I love her, I don't want her to die, but I'm going to move her on. It was a painful decision. Then the angel came that was dispatched from God and says, Everything that Mary said to you is true. She has been, she has been impregnated, but that baby that's in her has come from God, and he is going to be born Emmanuel, the Son of God. And with that, Joseph had a different attitude. Joseph didn't say a word, but he thought to himself, you know what, if God is going to do the unthinkable, then I'm going to go along with him on this unthinkable decision. And I'm going to respond accordingly. I am going to take her and marry her, and this child is going to be my child. I'm going to raise him as my own, my own adopted son. And so therefore, Joseph went a whole different way, and he took the unthinkable way of taking the baby, and the baby would be his son on earth. Amen? I have three questions that I want to throw at you. And we're going to be closing with these three questions. And the first one is simply this. When is it hardest to hear from God? Think about the question. When is it hardest to hear from God? Now, I brought three questions here because as an audience of people in this church, sometimes we hear, we go home, we forget. And then you go through a lot of ruckus and a lot of turmoil and a lot of upset. And you just think, well, where's God? Where's God in it? And after a while, you just give up. And then you go through religious motion of going to church and maybe you don't even read the Word. I don't know what your, I don't know what your, uh, uh, your, your premise is, what you do. But the truth of the matter is, God is always speaking. The Bible says, let he that has an ear hear what the Spirit is saying. The, Spirit, the Holy Spirit is constantly speaking, but we aren't always constantly hearing because just like you have a, a radio and you have a, a, a broadcasting station, you have to be tuned in to hear that station coming in, right? But when you're not tuned in in a radio, it doesn't mean that that station is not broadcasting. That station is always broadcasting. But if you're not tuned in with the proper frequency on your radio, you're not going to pick it up. And so if you're not tuned in with the Holy Spirit, you're not going to pick up what the Holy Spirit is saying to you on a constant basis. Because God doesn't want you to walk according to your own reasoning power. He wants you to walk according to His design, His plan. So I ask you the question, what is it hardest to hear from God? And the answer is, when you're going through turmoil. When you're going through a shaking. When your roller coaster of life is about to fly down and you're about you're being jolted and jilted and going through the loop-de-loops and you're losing your mind and you're screaming and you got white knuckle fear, it's hard, it's hard to hear God at that time. It's easy to hear God whenever you are everything's peaceful, everything's quiet, and everything's good to go. You can hear God. You can read the word and the words jump off the page at you. And you say, God was speaking to me today. But when turmoil break, breaks, when your problems arise, it's hard to hear from God. Why is that? Because you are trying to fix your problem. You have your hands trying to fix this, that, and the other thing. 
trying to fix your marriage, and finally you might get your marriage under control, and then you come to find that your finances are bro broke down, you're trying to fix that, you find that maybe your job is on the, on the fritz, maybe you're going to lose your job, you're trying to fix that, then your children go off the deep end, and you're going around like a chicken with your head cut off. And what happens is, as you are putting all of your focus on your problem, you are not keeping your focus and lending an ear on hearing what God is saying to you. When you are looking at your problem, you are looking at the moment, and which means that you are walking by sight. But we have been called by God to walk by faith. We have to see the unseen thing and recognize what God has intended for us. But you're not going to see the future if you're stuck to the present. Or even if you're stuck to the past of maybe bad decisions you have made. Amen? So we come to find that we're looking at all these things and we're trying to fix all these problems. And what happens is, the more you put your hand to and try to fix, the more you lose. Because God is nowhere to be found because he's letting you do your thing. But what does God tell us? God tells us in Psalm chapter 46, verse 10, Be still and know that I am God. Be still. That word still means rest. Be quiet. Stop running. Be still and know that I am God. I'm the same God that can speak to you when things are peaceful. I want to speak to you when all turmoil is broke loose in your life. Be still and know that I am God. God is saying, stop running around. I want you to just be at rest. Because the law, as long as you are running around trying to fix it, you're proving to me that you're, you doubt me. You're not putting your, you're not trusting me. You're not putting your attention on me. You're not acknowledging me. You're not putting me first and foremost. You're not believing that I will come through for you. That's doubt. But when you rest and take your hands off the situation, that's faith. And when you have faith in me, then you are going to see that what I will do I will begin to heal your marriage. I will begin to heal your children. I will begin to heal your job. I will begin to heal your finances. I will begin to heal your health. And along the way, while I'm bringing healing to all those circumstances, and I start your life back up on the ascension plane again, that you are moving onward and upward, I will keep your life and your heart and mind in perfect peace. And I will guard it in my Son, Jesus Christ. Amen? Can you say amen? You know what I found about Joseph? I found something out about Joseph. I was doing a little study on him. Joseph was a sleeper. Did you know he was a sleeper? Joseph liked to sleep. Anybody like to sleep? I'm telling you, Joseph, every time a problem occurred, Joseph went to sleep. What a beautiful habit he had. And then you would find in the next verse, it would say, and then an angel of the Lord came and spoke to him in a dream. Here he finds out in one, this one scenario that Mary says, I hate to tell you this, but I'm pregnant. He ponders it, and then what does he do? He, it says, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. He went right to sleep. <laughs> now why would he go to sleep? Because he knew something about God that we need to get a handle on. He knew that the God who watched over him and all of Israel never slumbers nor sleeps. He knew God's got my back. He knew I can't fix it. So why should I lose sleep over it? We have been losing so many hours of sleep trying to, be a, trying to fix things and also being afraid because we're, we're losing our minds because we are falling and we're going down for the count. And so what do we do? We're screaming. We're crying. We're trying to do this. We're trying to do... We're running around in a circle. Not Joseph. Joseph went to sleep. He realized, I can't, but he can't. I don't care how much you worry. You will not fix one iota of your problem. Jesus let us know that. He said, why would you worry? Your Heavenly Father already knows what it, ha what it is you have need of. So why would you worry about anything? Do you not see how He attends to the birds of the air? He takes care of their every day. And do you realize how He dresses the, 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 the lilies in the field? 
He gives them such a beautiful array of outerwear that they are even more magnificent than the outer apparel of Solomon. How much more does your heavenly Father love you that when you ask of him, he will grant it unto you, he will give it to you. And so that's what Joseph understood. Joseph understood, I know that God has my back. And so every time there was a problem, he went to sleep. I want you to understand that every time that you put your hand to the problem, and every time you're going to try to work it out, you're going to try to fix it, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, God will sit back and say, go for it. I'm out of it. Go for it. And you're going to find you're not going to fix a thing. All you're going to do, you're going to be exhausted because you're not getting any sleep worrying about it. But when you turn around and you come to realize that God is God and you be still, you be quiet, you rest in Him, and God is allowed to move, then God will take and He will bring healing to, and resolve to anything you're going through. Amen? Second question I've asked. When does it get difficult to follow God? Anybody been off the beaten track with Him at times? At times you're motivated, you keep on going, you're doing your thing, but then after a while, you, you kind of, I don't know how I got here. I'm in, I'm in a rocky place. When is it hard to follow God? When is it difficult to follow God? It's difficult to follow God under these conditions. When you first have a problem, when you are now going down this roller coaster ride, and all of a sudden you go down and you're screaming and you're crying and you're, you're jilted, you don't know what to do, and then all of a sudden you hear God speak because you're resting. You're resting for a moment. You hear God speak, and God speaks to you and says, Come on, follow me. Follow me. Now, how does God start to bring healing to you? Here's how God brings healings, healing to us. But pay attention to this. God opens up doors that no man can close. And he closes doors that no man can open. So what God does, he says, come on. And he always gets ahead of you. And he'll stay ahead of you. And he'll open up a door. But here, please, please listen to me now. A lot of people... Say, well, I've been praying. I've been praying to God. Oh, God, please come. Oh, God, oh, God. And you sit there like a bump on the log. You can pray till the cow jumps over the moon, but all you're doing is praying. You're not getting up, and you're not actively attempting. God opens up a door that no man can close. You need to push on that door. You need to find out, is that the door? Is it door number one, or is it door number two? Okay, just like the, the dating game or whatever they used to have on TV. But you have to understand, you need to push on the door. You need to try, is this where you want me to go, Lord? And God will close the doors along the way because he has a certain path that he's going to take you. And so he keeps on saying, follow me, follow me, follow. Now, he'll stay ahead of you all the time. He'll never allow for you to catch up to him. Because if you catch up to him, you won't need him anymore. So he stays ahead of you, and along the way, you're right with him. He hasn't brought a resolve in your life yet, but he's showing you, I'm, I'm on the move with you. Come on, follow me. And then all of a sudden, he goes down here, and he makes a left-hand turn. You say, wait a minute. Wait a minute here. I would never do that. That's not how I sense that I'm going to get out of this situation. That's not what I would do. And then all of a sudden, your mind goes into, uh, goes into occupation and you start to think, I would never do that. And what you do, you resist God. When I was on the road and I traveled for the many years and I was praying one day in Oklahoma for a service, God speaks to me ever so. And I wanted him to give me acknowledgement of what do you want me to do for the evening service. And then all of a sudden, he tells me, I want you to pastor. That didn't make any sense to what I wanted. That made no sense to me whatsoever for what I was about to do. But the truth of the matter is, that's what God does. God will say, follow me. Follow me. Come on with me. And as you're going, he will take a left-hand turn. He'll say, that's not how I want to do it. And then you resist God. And then you don't want to follow God anymore. Now, why does God do things that are so non-typical to the way we would do it? Here's why, and I want you to really catch this. The Bible says, in Isaiah 46.10, declaring the end from the beginning. Say that with me. Declaring the end from the beginning. Say it again. Declaring the end 
from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Declaring the end from the beginning. This is why we cannot assume that God is going to do things our way, put them in a box, and forget about Him. God doesn't work things out the same way we work things out. God works things out from the end to the beginning. We work things out from the beginning to the end. Amen? Well, God is omniscient. He knows all things, the middle, the, the beginning, the middle, and the end. God knew you before time began. God knew you and put you in your mother's womb, called you by name, knew the number of hairs upon your head, and He created you according to His good purpose. God had a purpose that He already instructed why He created you. And God saw you in the future, in the mature state of what He actually created you to become. I, uh, in uh, 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 Ephesians chapter 4, verse 10, that we are the masterpiece of God. God sees us in the finished work of what He has created us to actually become. So what God does, He looks at the final state of our life and He works backwards. And as He works backwards, He sees where there's problems, He sees where the track is a little broke, and He begins to fix things backwards to front. We only know from the front to the back, and we clash. We need to get out of the way. We need to allow for God to be God. We need to be still and know that He's in control. He's the one that created our life. He has every facet of our life in order. That's why He says these words, My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So you come to find that God is saying, get out of my way. You have no idea of what has to happen here, and you can't fix it. All you're going to do is mess things up. I already know what's necessary to do to contain, fix, and restore to get you on an upward climb. Because I'm working from back to front. Amen? Joseph followed God. Joseph made a decision when the angel came to him and said that what Mary said is true. So he decided, I'm going to follow God. And that one decision in his life made it whereas he would now become a friend to God. One decision in your life will paramount either you're going to be a, a friend to God or an enemy to God. Joseph said, I'm going to do the unthinkable. Because God is doing the unthinkable. I'm not going to resist him. I am going to work with him because I don't want to be left out of the miracle when the miracle comes. Amen? So Joseph followed God. The last question I have for you, when does it get difficult to trust God? When we look at the reality of our life and we see that Satan many a time is the, he is the, uh, the main catalyst He's the one that shapes our world. We recognize that. We see that. And many a time we're praying against that. Amen? But how do, you, how do you handle it when God's doing the shaking? How do you handle it when God's shaking your world? We look at this whole Christmas story. The devil's nowhere to be found in it. It's God doing all the work. It's God who had dispatched the angels to come to Zechariah and to Mary and to Joseph. It's God who took this teenage woman and this young man and they were ready to get married. It's God who put them in a place where they would be shamed by society. It's God who took this woman, nine months pregnant, and put her on the back of a donkey and had her ride a hundred miles to Bethlehem. It's God who fixed it where there would be nobody in the, no, no room in the inn where they would have to go into a stable, a stable that was filled with manure and stench and dirt and filth. It was God who caused 
the baby Jesus to be born in such an atmosphere. It was God who had him put in a feeding trough, which was nothing more. They called a manger. It was nothing more than a feeding trough. Whereas he would become the bread of life and all who would be hungry come and dine upon him. It was God who set all this up. Amen? Amen. Not the devil. It was God that set it all up for us to recognize that God is in control. What do you do? What do you do? When God is shaking your world, why did God shake their world? Because God was saying to them, I have a purpose behind it. Right now, Joseph and Mary, you are common ears. You have, your name is, is not even known by people except for your family. But when I'm done with you and I'm done shaking your world and turning your world right side up, I want you to know that you are going to be well known. Everyone is going to know your name for the next several thousand years, and they are going to know that you were part of my great plan that I was going to bring forth my child. Can you say amen? Amen. Let me tell you something. While God was moving from, that, from the end to the beginning, he was looking for an earthly father that would raise his son. Think about this. Joseph, the extra in this movie, <laughs> that, we're, that we're portraying. He was the one that God had chose to be the daddy on earth to the baby, Jesus. God could have picked out a king. God could have picked out a very wealthy man. God could have picked out a very intelligent man. God could have picked out a general. But when God was looking from the back to the front, he saw a man that would not waver in his faith no matter how difficult things came. He saw a man that would be the perfect man that would raise his son, that his son would watch with eyes wide open and recognize how he was to behave by looking at his, de his earthly daddy, how he would behave when problems came instead of running around and worrying that he would learn to rest. And that's what you find about Joseph. Joseph rested. Not only did he rest in Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, after Mary had said that, there was a, that she was pregnant with child, he went to sleep. Also, when Herod put out a decree that all the babies were going to die, two years of age and younger, Joseph rested. And an angel had to come to him and speak to him and said, Get up and go. He always fell asleep when there were problems. And Jesus watched this. And Jesus became as like his earthly daddy. That's why you come to find that Jesus, that when he was some 30 years of age, Jesus is in a boat with his disciples, and the, and, and the water is stirring. It's a hurricane-type wind that is coming, and the waves were high, and the boat looked like it was about to capsize, and his disciples were ready, and they were screaming, and they were crying because they thought that this was the end of their life, they were going to die. And they're saying, where's Jesus? And you know where he was at? He was on the back of the boat, sleeping like his daddy, Joseph. Like his daddy, Joseph. God said to Joseph, Joseph, you are a man of a fine example. Because you are exactly what I had noted and seen when I was looking from the back to the front. You are the one that I have chose to raise my son. Because one day, my son is going to have the weight of the world upon him. One day, when he sees the reality of what he's been on this earth for, he is going to come and say, Father, if it be thy will, take this cup from me. But he's going to remember how you dealt with every colossal problem that came down the pike. And over there in Luke chapter 22, he will turn around and he will say, But not my will, but thy will be done. And he will keep his eyes upon me no matter what and he will rest in my decisions just the way you have shown him and you have taught him amen and here's the real kicker god says joseph come here i want to tell you something think about this you're going to raise my son you're going to raise the child that's going to come and save the world you are going to be his daddy you're going to teach him how to play soccer <laughs> You're going to teach him that when he gets hurt, he's not going to be a mama's boy. You're going to take him and say, shut up, quit crying. Put a little dirt on it, don't tell your mom. You're going to give him a little nookie on the head. You're going to do all these things. You're going to, you're going to love upon him. You're going, to, you're going to be there to teach him many different things. 
You're going to be the one that's going to teach him how to spell. You're going to teach the one who taught you how to speak. You're going to, he's going to, you're going to teach him how to spell. And he's going, to be, he's going to be a carpenter just like you. He's going to learn to take the product of a tree, a tree that he created, and he is going to actually work it. And he's going to be a great carpenter just like you. So Joseph, I want you to know that one day I'm going to take you home with me. And he's going to be left behind. But as it is how a son sees his father, so the son will also imitate and become as like his father. You had shown him that you always, always kept your eye upon me, no matter how harsh the problems got. My son will have to learn to do that as well. Because there's going to be a lot of tragic situations come against him. People are going to laugh at him and mock him and want to kill him premature. People are going to want to ridicule him. They're going to want to throw him over a hill. They're going to, they're going to come against him. They're going to spit on him. But he's going to keep his attention on me because you've shown him to rest in me. And so church, what we have learned from what, everything I've shown you, that yes, you're going to have moments where you are on this roller coaster ride of life and you're going down for the count sometimes. And when you are going down for the count, remember this, that your peace is not the absence of a problem. Your peace is the presence of Jesus Christ in the midst of the problem. So what God wants us to do is to do the same as what Jesus learned to do through his earthly daddy. We need to learn to rest in him. When you rest in him, he will then take your problem and he will take it from where you are bottoming out and he will elevate you back up and you will go to a higher level on an uphill swing where the ride is exciting and joyful. I'm not saying you won't have problems. I'm just saying they won't have you. Can you say amen? amen. Would you stand with me? I think some of you already know the fact that you have seen the work of Christ. You have seen the work of Christ in your father. Your father is going to come out of the, the problem that he's in, that he wants to come home. He's coming out. Coming out. Some of you have seen that God has already restored you beyond imagination. God had taken you out of Ohio, brought you here. And when you were crying out, he better come through quick. I'm just repeating some things. Better come through quick because I'm running out of money. I don't know what I'm going to do. And God gave him a job. And God gave him a housing opportunity. And God gave him a beautiful job. And he's doing well. And he's now hired in. So you have to realize, I'm not giving you a bunch of garbage here this morning. These are realities. These are truisms. Michael was in so, in so much over, over his head in debt, and God opened up a door of opportunity for him to have the necessary additional income to be reprieved of the weightiness and the worry of that debt. God comes through. I don't care if you have a, a busted toe as something as small as a hangnail. He will come through. He will take care of because he has his eye on the sparrow. He loves each and every one of us the very same way. God, for some of you, maybe you haven't seen the uphill slide going up on an ascension again. But I want you to know that you are this close to turning it around. Get your hand off of it. You can't fix it. He that watches over Israel is watching over you. And he's going to attend to your every need. And even for those of you that he has already brought healing, he's going to bring additional healing. He's not going to stop there. Because it is, his, it is His love that He pours out. It is the goodness of God that is absolutely immeasurable, continual. It doesn't mean that, okay, I got the goodness of God today, I guess He's done with me. No, it says, the Bible says, He calls it grace upon grace. His grace is, for, is an effer, effervescent flow. It is constantly coming. He wants to bless you with more and more and more grace. What is grace? Grace is... Grace is something that you didn't work for. It is the favor of God. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. You didn't labor for it. It is just given to you. It has been poured upon you. And it's constantly coming. So what you do, you thank Him for His grace. But you get ready for more grace. 
Because you never, you never resolve your life, say, well, I got where I wanted to go. But he wants to go even further because he's working from the end to the beginning. And until you hit the final note of maturity of what he's created you to be, which again is his, his workmanship, until you get there, he's going to keep on blessing you. Because he's going to refine you. Why does he even allow you to go down in those times of testing? To get the world off of you. To get the dross off of you. To get you to realize that I'm here, even in the worst times. I want you to know that I am the God not only of, of good, but I'm the God when things are bad. I'm there. I'm there to restore you. My whole essence is to restore. I'm the God of restoration. And I want to just keep on bringing you higher and higher and higher and higher. How many of you want to receive that? Amen? Amen. That's your Christmas present from the Lord today. Thank you, Lord. Don't look back because God is just wanting to bless you. And all you have to have is the measure of a, a, a seed, of a mustard seed of faith. If you believe in him and stop believing in you, he will show up on the scene and he will take care of you. That's why the Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because what brings pleasure to the heart of God is when he can continue to show off himself to you and let you see. You think this is good? You wait till you see what I do for you tomorrow. And you wait till you see what I do for you next week. And you wait till you see what I do for you next month. God is always moving on the upswing. Amen? So I just want you to just stand there. I just want you to praise the Lord. Just close your eyes and give him thanks independently, individually. Give him thanks for what he's done for you already. Thank you, Lord. Some of you have heard you coughing and coughing. Give them thanks that your cough is going to be mended. Give them thanks in advance. I see Kandila, the whole of the Mahaya. I said, I die and I die Shanda, Kila, the Dondoya, the Mahaya. I see Kalanda, I shunned a higher Takaya. I see Kalanda, the higher Kila, the Kila, the Shandaya. I see Kalanda, she did a Nita. I see Kalana Mahaya, Tishanda, so for your Mahaya, so your Mahaya, Tira. God says, I am, a, I am a God of living proof. There are many other gods that man seeks, but they are not real, and they can do nothing. But I am the God of all heaven and earth. I am your God. You are my child. And when I want to do anything, there's nothing that can stop my favor that comes upon you. I want you to know that I have shown myself to you approved time and time again. Look back in the history of your life. Even before you came to know me, you will recognize that I was always there. I got you out of the worst predicaments. Whereas otherwise you may have been removed from this earth premature. But I was there to safe keep you. Because I have a plan for you. And my plan is beyond your wildest imagination. And I call upon you this day that you will follow me. You will follow me without hesitation. And come where I tell you to come and go where I tell you to go. And push. Push on those doors that seems to be possible before you. And if they're closed, don't push. But you will find the ones that are open. And those are the ways that I am going to send you onward and upward to a higher dimension of my anointing, my power, and my love. Heavenly Father, we praise you and we thank you for today. Father, we thank you for this beautiful time spent together. We thank you for your spirit, for your presence, 
We thank you for your word, Father God, that your word constantly grooms us, grows us, and sets us free. So, Lord God, you are a God that is beyond anything that we could ever, ever dream up. Because, Father God, your word tells us that when we are faithless, you remain faithful. But, Lord God, you're always there. You're always there in the most midnight hour. You are the midnight hour God. When it seems to be a hopeless situation, you arise. You arise at that pinnacle point and you take care of situations that there's no way that we could ever imagine how we could have ever done that. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you for your, we thank you for the many blessings that you bestow upon us. And Father, as we are about to enter into the Christmas holiday itself, Father, I'm asking that, Lord God, that the world would stop believing that it's nothing but, but a happy holiday, that they will recognize the true reason for the season, that you are the reason that we celebrate. And it's not about how much money we can spend and buying one another gifts. Those are all wonderful things. But, Father, it's all about remembering you, remembering you and the beauty of what was given to us as a free gift. For God our Father so loved us in this world that he gave his only begotten Son. And Father, as we called upon him and recognized him as Lord and Savior, that we shall receive everlasting life. We thank you for it. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen.